Hey everybody, welcome back to Northern Lion Plays the Binding of Isaac Adder. Possibly we'll win it? I don't know. I just got back. It's, the, it's exposing the length of the backlog, which is actually not that long right now. 2K3Z, 1B8S. It's not that long because literally like, well, 24 hours ago, I got off a plane that arrived from a place that was... Eight hours away, but also 17 hours in the future, closer to nine hours away, I guess. It's very strange. You know, for those of you unaware, Kate and I went to South Korea to partake in a little bit of uh, Olympic hockey viewing, which, if you follow the Olympics, you know went very well <laughs> for for Canadian hockey fans. Um, but it was it was a fun time. Not even nonetheless, it was just a full time uh, a fun time full stop. But it's very weird when you come back from being so far away, not because of like, well, they, they, in Korea, they tend to eat rice, and here we tend to eat bread, isn't that weird? It's more like, um, you know, you get on a plane, Tuesday, 6 p.m., yeah, I'll take it, why not? You get on a plane Tuesday at 6 p.m., and then when you land at home, it's Tuesday at 11 a.m., and then you take a little nap, and you wake up, and it's Tuesday at 6 p.m. And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Something about this doesn't seem right. I, it was Tuesday at 6 p.m. I know th this is a bit that now has become time zones exist, but um, Tuesday at 6 p.m. You get on a plane, watch uh, approximately 100 movies. And then you land, get in the taxi, go home, take a nap. You take a nap, you wake up, it's the same time as when you left. It's like some Hotel California stuff. Eh, we might as well, it's kind of a boring first floor, but we might as well take it. But yeah, I'm back. I got stories. The stories will largely probably happen on the NLSS, but you know, we'll, we'll dip into them a little bit as as warranted on this show. It was fun to be away. I, for those of you who were not aware, it sounds so bad. It was fun to not be here, but I mean, it was. <laughs> no matter how much you like your job, it's nice to have a... A vacation from reading Slay the Spire comments. I used to. I don't know, like, how much inside baseball you know about, like, streaming and YouTube and stuff like that, but people that do this for a living don't ever leave because we got a real. And this is not me complaining, by the way, because I'm, I'm the exception that uh, proves the rule, maybe, but um, y you got a lot of work to do on a regular basis. And the model for YouTube and, and Twitch success is really feed the beast, especially Twitch. It's like, you can't go away, because if you go away, some whippersnapper who wants the job more than you is going to stream, and he's going to slowly pill for your audience, or she, for that matter. So, you, you, you know, beyond that, you know, when you're not streaming, you're not getting subscribers and viewers, and it's, you get the idea. Basically, the point is... People that do this, they tend not to leave, and then eventually what happens is that instead of planning to go somewhere, they just burn out and blow up on stream and then go, okay, I gotta take a few days off because you guys are being jerks. So, um, the, the thing that I wanted is, it's not just merely, what, basically what I wanted to do by starting this video is just completely crap on all of my colleagues and say, uh, I'm smarter than they are and, and I've got my, my stuff more handled, obviously. That's, that's pretty much my vibe for the most part. I'll take this. No, obviously I'm being sarcastic, but I, I'm doing this all to illustrate that, uh, you know, people that are, you know, full-time streamers, YouTubers, they tend not to take time off. Because there's anxiety that comes with it, you know? And I gotta admit, oh, it's a little frame rate hitch there. I gotta admit, I used to get that anxiety pretty bad when I was on vacation. I, you know, a couple of days on vacation, I was like, this is really fun. And then the... You know, third or fourth day, I'm like, how's the critical response to the videos I made that have gone up while I'm gone? And it's like, you don't want to get, you end up making these posts that are like, first off, you get upset because, you know, you're in a different place and you're reading comments that are not so nice. And you're like, why are you being mean to me? I'm on vacation. And they're like, we're not being mean. We're just trying to teach you that Cleave is not a strictly better strike. And you're like, no, nah, it's, I've gotten over it, basically. I, I've basically, oh my god, Bear Tabby sent me a message. Don't forget, the Devil Deal only shows up if you don't take red heart damage. Dude, I've been gone for nine days. He thinks I've forgotten how to play Isaac. Who, who do you think I am? Uh, you? I don't know. The joke doesn't really work. 
Thought the vacation might have scrambled you a bit. Oh, an egg joke. Good one, Bear Taffy. Hey, why don't you uh, get your paws out of the honey pot and uh, stop forcing us to leave our food in a refrigerator when we go camping? Otherwise, you're gonna come eat it and kill us all. It's bears when you when you camp. Bears, uh, you know, you gotta hide your food or they'll try to. You get the idea. You know, you we got a very outdoorsy audience here, so you know the deal. Anyway. It's hard, it's hard for people to do what I do to be away. Really, it's the hardest job on Earth, is what I'm trying to say. Um, wait, what's, you know, a combat medic? Oh, well, sounds like you get free travel. Must be nice. One second, I made myself some coffee here. And I'm just... Ugh, it's a French press, but I packed it, like, way too hard, so... Oh, look at this. That is, like... I don't even know, man. That's the, the color of, like, sadness right there. But in, like, a good way, I'm excited to drink it. Anyway, this whole, po this has gone on too long, but it's hard for uh, people that do what I do to be awake because it's anxiety-inducing. But I've gotten over it, I, I think. And, or at least naively, I think I've gotten over it. And instead, I, I was mostly managing to uh, disconnect and, you know, come back refreshed. And it was good to be away. It was good, good to be away and good to come back. I always... Try to come back refreshed, because that's what I, I worry about when it's the streamers who never leave. Not to insult them at all, but I, I just think it's like bad planning. You know, you you never leave, and the only time you have a vacation is when you like get irritated at your chat, so you end up, you, you know, alienating some of your fans. And then when it's time for you to decompress and go somewhere, you're like, well, I accidentally took a week off, so I think I'm just gonna do my laundry instead. Not that I haven't had some staycations. There's nothing wrong with the staycation. I just think it's better to plan it out in advance. So we watched some Olympic games. We watched, uh, you know, spoilers. Uh, watched the Canadian women's team lose the gold medal match to the United States in what was an all-time classic, uh, yet at the same time, Disappointing. Then the next night we went and we watched the Canadian men's team uh, in, in hockey, in case you're not familiar with my nationality, um, lose uh, another historic game against Germany. And honestly, just like that was unfathomable um, for, for Canada to lose to Germany in ice hockey, at least on like a, an Olympic level, is absurd. But I got over it. And um, I mean, I was over by the time the game ended, mostly because it was 4 1 for Germany heading into the second period. <laughs> But there were some, there were some devastated people around, and uh, that that vibe continued for a long time. I gotta say, uh, German hockey fans, first off, congratulations. I don't know, I, I, this, these videos have a certain contingent of, of German viewership that's like larger than you would expect, considering I only know like, you know, Guten Tag and Ich bin ein Berliner, but uh, classy and enthusiastic. I was having like a, a true Canadian's worst nightmare at the game because as the game went on and on we were surrounded by other Canadians because you know who else is gonna pay exorbitant prices for ice hockey tickets in an Olympics that doesn't even feature NHL caliber players um, and the Canadians that I was around some of them were very nice some of them were just becoming total garbage as the game went on is because you buy the tickets and you're like I can't wait to see us beat Germany 9 to 1 and then it's 4 1 for Germany after the second period and you're like my worldview is collapsing on itself we need both of these absolutely um, and they, they turned into people who were extremely impolite I was upset to see it happen dude I think we're just out of this floor honestly well, we should maybe buy a spirit. Ah, it doesn't matter. We just got to deal with the devil. Let's head down. Um, this this run is amazing already. Out of control. There's nothing more frustrating than, you know, being a Canadian. Well, there's probably many things more frustrating than this. Like being a combat medic, for example. There's nothing more frustrating than, than being a Canadian. Um, a, a country that is renowned for its politeness and considers it, you know, one of its core values. And then you start losing a hockey game. And not only are the people around you perhaps being a little offensive to our, our German friends, be like, ah, I mean, I'm not going to say that some of the terrible, I'll say that on the NLSS where there's no, you know, possibility of getting my video Logan Paul here, right? But the thing is, not only were the Canadians being impolite to the German friends 
you know, who had just come to watch a hockey game and should be proud of their country for playing really well, but also you're like, wait a minute, I can't even pretend to be from another country because everybody's wearing hats that say C-A-N-A-D-A -A -A and jackets that say C-A-N-A-D-A, -A -A. and I'm like, then, you know, there's Koreans sitting around us because, you know, it's their country where the Olympics are, and they're like, I can't wait to watch hockey, this is going to be fun, and they're just like walking into the a freaking viper pit of people being furious, and I always heard Canadians were so nice. But you, they, they lost their Canadian values uh, by being scored on too many times. Anyway, it was a good time. You know what's weird about uh, about being in another country? I'm, I'm hesitating with how to phrase this. But there's a point here, I just want you to give me, a, a, give me enough rope to hang myself. What's weird about being in a country like Korea, as someone who's not Korean, and the, the country is like 90... I mean, look, probably shouldn't be saying it without looking at the demographics, but it's like 90-something percent Korean. It's a very, like... I don't mean this in a bad way. It's a very ethnically homogenous country to the extent that, like, there were a lot of days where you'd be outside and you'd be like, oh my god, it's a white person. And I lived there for a year, and I, the same thing, you know? When you live there, though, you're kind of like, this is my own exotic fiction. I'm living in a foreign country, and when I saw another uh, foreigner, I would be like, don't make eye contact. This is my, I'm the only one here. This is my journey, okay? Don't cloud up my journey by reminding me that it's a global world. I, and you know, half the signs here in our, are in English. I'm, I'm doing my own exotic thing right now and you can't stop me. But I, I only say this to illustrate the point that you don't know on the subway, it gets so crowded, you know? But then if I'm sitting down, for some reason, I always have an empty seat next to me. And I was, I found myself going like, should I be offended or flattered or somewhere in between? I'm like, are these guys not, are people not sitting next to me because I'm, I look different than them, in which case I would be offended, or are they like, this guy's clearly not from around here, Let's, uh, you know, be polite and give him some extra space instead of crowding him up. And I guess, you know, the the answer is I can't know, but I think it, it's funny. Oh my god, how many on-suits do we have here? We don't need that one makes you small, come on. It's funny, but I found my, at first I was like, I was wavering back and forth between like, the people here like me or hate me, and I think the honest answer is that they're, you know, everybody's too wrapped up in their own lives to really, uh, to really care for the most part. But I don't get that in Vancouver. If I'm in Vancouver and I'm sitting on the SkyTrain and then people are choosing to stand rather than sit next to me, I'm like, yeah, that's right. This is my seat. <laughs> I want my personal space. And I'm in a foreign country and, uh, you know, people don't sit next to me. I'm like, oh! Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that I must have missed a memo or something that, oh, do I stink? I don't know. It's, I don't know, I probably shouldn't be so defensive about it. It happens in Japan, too. It's, it's also funny, like, um, you know, Kate is Korean, in the sense that she was born in Korea. Um, but, like... She had, like, the exact opposite experience. Like, we'd all be wear we were both wearing, like, branded Canada gear. Because that's what you do with the, uh, Olympics. And, you know, on the train, nobody sits next to me. Next to her, 75-year-old Korean dude just putting his elbows out, trying to, you know, get some more space for himself. I'm like, dude, you know what? I think I got it pretty good. <laughs> I think it could be worse. Anyway. We're moving on here. It's weird, um, it was weird to be back in a country I, I lived in, but have not been to for, like, nearly a, it's not really nearly a decade, but it's like, you know, five or six years. Because I, all, there's so many things, I want to say, like, you ever have a friend who's, like, they ate, you know, Chinese food once, and then their identity is, like, they love... Chinese food. By the way, I totally whiffed on what I wanted to do with walking here, and it resulted in me taking no damage. I think my accidental brain is better than my deliberate brain at that room. You know, the... And, by the way, I, I've been that friend. <laughs> you know, when 
They like, oh, General So's chicken. Mm, uh, delicacy from the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it says here that it was uh, created by Emperor Wei Shaoxie of the uh, Jin Dynasty, who, uh, well, the thing is, General So, you get the idea. You know, you, you try something once and you go, oh, this is my life now. I never know, uh, when, when I was back in Korea, I didn't know if, like, my perception of the country had changed because I was older. My perception of the country changed because my position in life is different. My perception of the country has changed because the country has changed, because it's been so long. Or, or if something else was involved. Like, I swear to you, I was walking around and I was going, oh my god. How many Taco Bells are in this country now? When I was in South Korea, this, by the way, you were, you were probably like, oh, is he going to talk about um, increasingly becoming a, a global power in a, in a world that's connected by the internet and telecommunications? No, I'm talking about fast food. Obviously, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> you ever watch this freaking show? We're not talking about their place in the world. Um, no, we're talking about Taco Bells. When I was a, when I taught in South Korea, we went to Seoul once, and everyone was like, I'm so excited to go to Seoul. There's a Taco Bell in Itaewon, which is like a very foreigner-friendly district in Korea. When I say foreigner, by the way, it, I always forget that it has uh, different connotations. And by always, I mean, like, I... I I should really just preface it, I guess. Dude, hook me up. This is an incredible run. We are the foreigners when we go to Korea, is what I mean. I think we should pick this up as well. Why not? Polyphemus Incubus Succubus Little Brim and Almost Guppy and Almost Spun as well. Anyway. I don't know. I might take that. It's not like we're using the D6 for much else. We've gotten such good items already. Um... But yeah, we'd be like, oh my god, we gotta go to one of Korea's two Taco Bells. And I still didn't. I've still yet to go to a Taco Bell in my life, but I still, I chart their existence like a, it's a website built by Malf or something like that. Um, they were, I wouldn't say everywhere, but I was like, there's multiple Taco Bells. There's multiple, like, I mean, McDonald's, obviously, but, you know, KFC is crushing it here. It, it just felt like... There were more, like, Western stores I've ever seen before. Like, I, when I saw Lush, I was like, really? Lush? But then, you know, the more things uh, change, the more they stay the same to some extent as well. I was like, yeah, it's, you know, I can still walk into a, a kimbap chungguk and be like, you know, hey, kimchi kimbap dugeju seo. And just because of the fact that I can order food, People will first giggle and then go, nay, which is yes, and then give it to me. And I never know whether I should be offended or, or flattered. <laughs> it's actually, we were at, I think I'm going to reroll. Let's, yeah, it's not too bad. We were at the airport and um, we had a little time to kill, so we were having a couple drinks before our flight. Uh, and, you know, forgive me, it's 900 hours long. And by the way, it's another little anecdote coming right up, I suppose, but. Korean Air, great service, good meals, um, in economy class, free adult beverages, which is incredible, and it, this is not a joke. This sounds like something you'd make up if you were like 14 and wanted to have an airline, but this is real. At any point in the flight, you can hit your like service light, and they'll come over, and you can say, hey, can I have some instant ramen? And they'll be like, yeah, and they'll just bring you instant ramen and boiling water. In boiling water, I should say, and you can eat some instant ramen on your flight, which you might say I would never do that, but you would because you're on the flight for 900 hours. You get hungry, you know? They do serve you two meals, but like they're always, and I, you know, it, this is probably a personal problem. Whenever I fly, whatever you eat when you fly doesn't count towards any kind of like diet or nutritional plan. Give me 3,000 calorie meals when I fly. First off, I'm locked in an aluminum case. 35,000 feet above the earth. Secondly, I got nothing else to do. I'm just bored. Just give me something to eat, please. What do we have? I, we might as well smelt it. It's not like we're doing anything else with our time. Should ha have left that, probably, but... Um, I think we also might as well. Then we'll go for a reroll here. But anyway, on the way there... I was looking at the movies, there were like 20 movies on the Seaback Entertainment. Nothing wrong with that, that's not like, uh, unreasonable. I'm 
trying to think of what I watched on the way there. We watched Murder on the Orient Express, which was fine. We watched Blade Runner 2049, which is just an incredible film. I watched Logan Lucky, which was fun. Not not even bad, because whenever people go, yeah, that movie was fun. It's always like, it sucked. It didn't suck. It was good. But it, like, lasting appeal for me? Not really, but it was still, it was good. And I watched one other thing. I can't remember what it was, but I was like, that's ah, okay. But that was like the best of the best selection, except for the film Dunkirk. And then we'll get to that anecdote in a second here. Um, but I didn't want to watch Dunkirk because I'd already watched Blade Runner 2049 on the flight. And I was just like, I know this sounds like a caricature, like my own caricature of millennials, but watching two movies like that is kind of exhausting. No, but I, I was like, I want to watch something, you know, more fun, I guess, after Blade Runner, which is like a meditative three hour experience. A three-hour experience. Nah, we don't need the nail. And what do we get here? Uh, Anti-grav. Stigmata. No. Eh, I mean, Deadeye is incredible. Hear me out here. Give me Deadeye and then just kill me dead. I'm ready to go. Teleport me. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Thank you. Um, I mean, we, we could still lose this one because I'm being a little silly, but... That was all the good movies, more or less. On the way back, I looked at this. It's a shorter flight west to, well, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's even west to east, or sorry, east to west, now that I think about it, because, you know, you kind of cross over the right edge of a map. But, I mean, I guess you are traveling east the whole time. But this is a whole different thing. Anyway, the point is, it's a shorter flight coming back from Korea than it is going there. And I had that little sneaking suspicion, because both of our flights were in the same calendar month, that the movies were going to be the same, and lo and behold, they were. So on the way back, I watched Valerian, City of a Thousand Planets. And you know what? I, I did not like it. And I think that that's a very common opinion to have about that movie. But it was fun. And I don't need That time I do mean it kind of insulting. But at least, it, like... It, it was bad in my opinion, and the main characters were wooden. They were wooden in the book too. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I mean, I won't read that either then. Um, but like, I, I did not like that movie. I think that's like a three. Then I watched. Uh, at least it was it was like actually kind of colorful and adventurous and fun. I don't think it succeeded in what it was going for, but it was an entertaining three. At least I was like, ah, oh, I wonder how the the train wreck will go next. Uh, then I watched The Hitman's Bodyguard, a comedy film starring Samuel L. Jackson and Ryan Reynolds, um, which was another three, but again, like, kind of an okay three, where I was like, yeah, I could see my... If that, if that came on TV on a Sunday, and I wasn't doing anything else, I might just, like, leave it on. Because I have no respect for my time. Um... Let's start here. This is this run. You couldn't ask for a more blessed like return from vacation run than this one right here. We have 22 damage. <laughs> like without any weird like oh 22 damage, but your fire rate is absolutely terrible. We have Polyphemus, so it's not great, but like st it's still really, 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 really good. Um, so I was like, that's like a three. Uh, and then. I'm just trying to illustrate, like, the depth of... There was not anything, by the way, after Dunkirk, which is what I watched next. And I was like, I enjoy it. But then when I tweeted that I watched Dunkirk, everyone was like, lol, watching Dunkirk on a 9-inch plain screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'll invent a time machine and go back and watch it in theaters. It was... Like, I get that it was it was a kind of a visual uh, tour de force, if I can put it in the most uh, ridiculous overblown way possible, but I was like, I didn't feel compromised by watching it on a screen. I was having a good time watching it. It was like an 8. I didn't like, admittedly, I didn't like it as much as uh, a lot of other Christopher Nolan films, but I thought it was very good. And then after that, I was like, oh my god, there's actually nothing. And I watched a movie that shook my faith and my taste to the core. It was called Brad Status. It's from 2017, stars Ben Stiller. I gave it a one. I hated it. I hated everything about it. I thought, and this is not to say that movies always have to have likable characters, but the gist of it, by the way, this movie has an 82 on Rotten Tomatoes, which is what shook me to the core. Uh, ben Stiller 
plays a, a 47 year old man who has very successful friends from college. Like one of his friends from college is basically like a CNN political correspondent who's written a lot of books and stuff like that. One of them is like a hedge fund manager and then one of them is a Hollywood director and then he's, I'm just an architect. Mm. Something like that. I don't know if he. Oh, he's not an architect. Sorry, he, work, he works at a non-profit organization that he founded himself. You know. I'm just the CEO of my own non-profit. Ooh. And then his son. Nah, we can't with four HP. We can't do it. His son is uh, college age, and he's starting to look at colleges. And he's a very talented musician with great grades. Is looking like he's going to go to Harvard, maybe. So it, the movie. It, it, it just, like, I can't stress enough that Ben Siller's character in this movie is just human garbage. Just the worst human being on planet Earth. He's got a beautiful wife who loves him. And then, you know, he hangs out with, like... It, these are spoilers to some extent, but nothing happens in the movie. So, like, it, it's not really like there's anything to spoil. He's like, oh, I got a beautiful wife. I love her. You know, she really, uh... She fits me in all the right ways. That's a very weird way to describe that, but, um... He hangs out with, like, one of his son's 22-year-old friends for 10 seconds and is, like, imagining running away with her and living in Hawaii and, you know, maybe my life would be so much better if my wife wasn't so nice to me and always made me, like, not be motivated to be better. And I'm like, Brad, these are your problems. And this is what said he alternates, like, being happy that his son's going to Harvard and then, like, being jealous of his own son for going to Harvard. And then he calls up his supposed friends from college and they're like, hey, Brad, it's nice to hear from you. But he's concocted these fictions in his head where, like, they're total jerks. So he calls up, you know, the hedge fund manager and is like, hey, buddy, how's your private jet going for you? And he's like, pretty good. You know, my daughter's in the hospital. And he's oh, cool, can I ask a favor of you? You know, he's just a total piece of garbage. And I was watching the movie and I was going, that's the moral of the story, right? The moral of the story is that Ben Stiller is like an actual sociopath in this movie. And I was reading responses and Ben Stiller plays a troubled father who means well. And I'm like, no, no he plays... You got, you got to be happy for your friends and for your for your kid, especially. Like, your friends, whatever. I get that maybe there's a certain level of competition there. But your kid is just like, good God. I, and I like these, like, complicated films about adulthood and what it means to get older and stuff like that as well. But I was just like, at some point, Ben Stiller, you would just, his character in this movie would be better if they died. The, the world would be better if they died. Everybody would be happier if Ben Stiller's character did not exist. He's like talking to... Okay. Take it. Take another little item to damage your baby. Um, I mean, we don't really want too much more of this, honestly. This is a good year. This is just an incredible run in the whole scheme of things. Um, movie opens, and you're like, oh, it's Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller's like 40 to... 50 year old uh, filmography is essentially like, I'm getting older, but I'm not quite an adult, mentally speaking. And I like Ben Stiller, by the way. Tropic Thunder is actually maybe one of the top, like, few comedies of the 2000s. I watched Zoolander when it came out. I own it on DVD. I watched Zoolander 2 when it came out. I hate it. It's a piece of trash. Um,. You know, I like Greenberg well enough. I've never seen The Secret Life of Walter Mitty because, uh... The, well, I was gonna be rude and dismissive, but really I just don't think... I kinda... I went through that, you know? I, I was really in the Garden State when it came out. Those movies that are like, you know, it's an adult trying to find themselves. I get it. I'm not against it, but... You know, I already had my Walter Mitty. His name was Zach Braff. And he betrayed me like Ben Stiller will betray you when you see Brad status. Uh, but yeah, he's he opens the movie and he's talking to his wife and he's like, hey, I can't sleep, I'm nervous about money. And she's like, why are you nervous about money? You're like, we're doing fine. You know, we live in a huge house in Northern California. And he's like, yeah, but that's not enough for me for some reason. Because uh, he's ignorant of other people's problems. Um, this is not spoilers, because it's literally like two seconds into the movie. He goes, hey, how, how much do you think your parents' house is worth? 
And she goes, I don't know. And he goes, I don't know. What, like a $2 million? $2.5 million? And she goes, I don't know. And then he goes, you think we'll get it when they die? Hey, Brad. You can't say that. You can't ask your wife how much your parents are worth and whether or not you're going to get their house when they die. Because in your mind, you're like, that would be a big stress off my shoulders. In her mind, she's going, uh, you just... You're, you're having a casual conversation about my parents dying. It's not really like a good moment. Anyway, that's Brad's status. It sucks. Don't watch it. It's got an 82 on Rotten Tomatoes. It should have a 1 over 82. That's right. 0.13% out of 100. Hey, thanks for watching. It's not 0 0.13, it's just 1 1.3. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. A little bit of a quick one here. If you did, click the like button. It helps out a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.